my computer issues I, I you know it sits here for 15 hours doing nothing and as soon as i click the mouse it's like wait 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 i've got to do something <laughs> i've got to do an upload just wait 15 minutes <laughs> how's it going everyone uh we've got uh, robbo and bob in today and any of the randoms that float past <laughs> like sawdust um today <laughs> I'm going to try and make a, um, I'll say try because I must be stuffed up. Hence the reason why I've got a couple of blanks. Um, I just need to make a, um, a port tap extension. Yeah, it's just this tap, it's like, it's tiny like this. And yeah, so I'll just make a piece of wood to go on the end. And the tap handle's not actually round. The bits you grab, they're actually a, an oval shape. So, that'll make it interesting. Robbo, are you talking to us? Because you're muted. Yeah, I know. I just figured that out. Um, <laughs> yeah, did you get the biggest diameter of the, the tap or the smallest? I got the length of the, from one handle to the other. And then I and then I measured uh, how high the actual one one handle is side of one handle is. Yeah, well, I take it you're going to drill a hole down the end of it. Yeah, I was going to do the smallest hole I could, and then um, try and carve it out a little bit with the Dremel because it's more of an oblong shape. No, I just drill it. I just drill it the size of the the biggest diameter. Good day, Neil. Good day. Good day. Good day. What are we talking uh, about? Uh, there's the spigot tap on a on a wine barrel. You know the little barrels they put on bars for port and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the lady's having the lady that wants this done is having trouble because she's got arthritis in her hands and the bloody things are only about an inch long and she can't get any purchase on it. So Jay's making her an extension for the handle on it. Yeah. Drop your handle, Joey. Ah. <laughs> uh. What are you up to today, Neil? Have you managed to move out of the house yet? <laughs> I just had a shower. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think. I think. No wonder. No wonder. No wonder you haven't got the camera on then. <laughs> I managed to fix the fridge yesterday, but so all I got left, and I've tested all the rest, uh, but I've still got issues in the TV area. So, because uh, oh, yeah. I switch between power on the the TV versus the, the satellite sort of thing. So, and there's something funny going on there. So that's the only thing I've got to fix now. The wiring was black and funny on the inside. That's why it wasn't working. It's almost like it went mouldy. It was weird. No, it's corrosion. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. it was. And that, that is, that is why we don't use soldered joints. Uh, this wasn't soldered. Yeah, I know, but I'm just saying that's one of the main reasons we don't use solder on them. Uh, yeah, it was weird, but anyway. I just cut it off and redid it. Yeah. Yeah, well, it does, it does cause, when it's got corrosion like that down, and it does cause resistance in the lines too. Yeah, well, I got rid of the, the line anyway, going from the fridge switch to the uh, fuse box because there's actually three lengths joined together. I must have had troubles and I've just grabbed any old piece out of my thing to get me out of trouble. Yeah, well, so, that's probably old wire. Yeah, probably was. So I just turfed it out and put a new one in. 
That's probably why it was rusting. Uh, yeah. You don't use copper? Yeah, it is copper. But copper it gets a tarnish. Rust. Oh, yeah, it no, oxidizes. It gets, yeah, yeah, that's it. Of course, he could go for oxygen-free, you know, U-butte wire in there. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Stop that. Uh -huh. No, if you've used old wire, that's probably the reason why. Yeah. I must have been on a trip somewhere and uh, used what I had. Well, that's right. It was also connected to the wrong fuse as well, like the same fuse power, but it wasn't the one marked fridge, so I fixed that while I was at it. Oh, yeah. Always something going wrong. Uh, this is true. But I can only work an hour at a time because it's on my knees the whole time and I'm sitting oh, up, yeah. I'm kneeling on a cushion, but it still kills me. Yeah. I know that feeling well. Well, my back's giving me more trouble than my knees at the moment, but yeah. Yeah. I have to agree with that on my end here. I got to, they supply me with back braces, which are elastic with reinforced uh, pieces to keep my back straight. Yeah. But just standing at the lathe for quite a while, it'll, because I, I don't know. I probably just don't stand right. But well, that's a possibility. I try. The big problem is, is I'm used to leaning over what I'm doing so I can see. Because I have no depth perception. I can only use one eye at a time. Oh, I got so I was born that way. But... Have you tried lifting the lathe up a little bit, Bob? Uh, it's already up four inches, and that's quite a bit for a Powermatic. Though I might yeah, have to go again. No, at a, oh, a bloke I taught turning a few years ago, his, his thing was mainly bowls and hollow forms. And what we did was we nearly lifted his lathe up another foot so that it was actually, it was nearly in eyesight straight down the, the vase that he was doing. <coughs> yeah, when I do the deep hollowing, yeah, I'm always bent over to do that. I can't help it. Yeah. Though I have cheated at times, I've got a a bar stool, a four-legged stool, a kitchen stool. It's wood with a nice padded seat. And uh, once I get the rig set up, I can actually sit down and turn the uh, because I've got emergency shutoff switch on the lathe in series with the, the regular switch on it. Yep. And it's in a portable magnetic box, so I can put it in anywhere I want to, lathe, bed, frame, and have it at my fingertips. This is one thing that astounds me with a lot of a lot of turners, that they have remote switches for their lathe with all the variable speed and everything on it, and they still stick it on the headstock instead of out of the way on the tailstock end. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have to laugh at that. Would you believe I got told off at the club for moving it? Yeah, well, I get told off when I'm there too, but I tell them no. Just think about it this way. You've got to walk past the danger area to bloody will switch them off all the time. Yeah. I, I, for a while there, they were actually leaving them there, but I knew they'd revert back to their old bloody habits as soon as I wasn't there. Yeah. Bloody hopeless. They really are. No, they'll just have to have an accident in there one day and they'll realise it. 
Well, we've had a few, but yeah, just yeah. What can I say? No comment. Yeah. This is probably my last year at the club, so. Oh yeah. I don't know. Oh, since I've got the big lathe, I don't need them anymore, so. No, it's not. All right. And they don't want my help, so fine. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. You don't go for the camaraderie, then. I used to, but uh, unfortunately, the, the the ones I like the most died. So. <laughs> Bugger. Yeah. That that reminds me. Jack Williams is dead, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he died about three or four years ago. Oh, that was only... Jack was only last year. Oh, well, anyway. Yeah. Um, I got a friend request from him today. <laughs> okay, that's weird. That's fake. Must be, another, must be another Jack Williams. No, it was his picture and everything else. And I, I, I didn't... I just deleted it, but um, I was just wondering if perhaps it was his wife or somebody that was trying to reactivate his account. Good question, don't I? I steal his identity. Sounds weird. I'd report it to fake, Facebook as a fake account. Tell him the dude died. <laughs> I'll get onto that like flies on shit. Hey? It was a shamey past. He was a good bloke. Yeah, it was. He was the funniest bloke I've ever met. <laughs> yeah, he had a wicked sense of humour. Yeah, he offended quite a few women, but uh, yeah, it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he you've proven that he, in spirit, isn't dead. Yeah, well, that's... A, yeah. No, and the that's Twilight... That's a compliment. Twilight Zone music started there for a while, I tell you. Do-do-do-do-do-do. <laughs> Good old Rod Serling. Yeah. Because I tell you what, he was involved in a lot of lot of things. I was just flicking through YouTube last night because I had nothing better to do, and uh, he actually wrote quite a lot of things too. Like there was one with Lloyd Bridges in it last night huh? called "The Loner," and uh, he wrote that Rod Serling. So yeah, he's involved in quite a few things by the sound of it. Oh. Funny seeing all the actors when they were young, you know. Oh. <laughs> and do you remember? Do you remember Sea Hunt, Neil? Oh yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, never missed it. Oh, just got an emergency weather warning. Huh? Severe thunderstorm warnings with high winds until oh. ten forty-five tomorrow morning. We had that. We had that about three or four weeks ago, and parts of our state are still without power and not not getting them for three weeks. Oh. <laughs> and got pretty windy the, down there. Utilities local or national? No, they're statewide, just states. Hmm. But um, no, there's big signs up saying you know that one particular national park is completely closed because there's been 300 foot tall Mount Nashes that have come down, and 
blocking all the paths and everything like that, and they're trying to clear them out and taking power lines and everything out with them. They had to send 27 men in and women yesterday to get a woman out that decided to go bushwalking. And she hurt herself climbing over one of the dead down trees, you know. <laughs> took, them seven, took them something like six hours to get them out because they had to chainsaw all the trees to get access into there. Shame we couldn't leave them there. Add to the fertiliser. Well, yeah. But as the bloke said, like there were... There were groups of 20 and 30 with young kids and everything wandering around in there too. G'day, Mike. How are you? People just are absolutely stupid. Now, Jay, do you want to know a little trick for putting an elong elongated hole in that if you want to? Yeah, all right. We'll get that off there first. Get to cut off the, the main blank. Right, now take the chuck out, take the chuck off, and take the, the Jacob's chuck out of the tail stock. Geez, you're a busy boy tonight, Bob. No, that's the uh, emergency weather popping up on my phone. Uh. Well, that was a bit easy enough for it was going away. Yeah. Whoa. Right now, about five miles, well, 10 miles away, and they're saying they have hail and high winds, 60 miles right, an now, hour winds. Now put the Jacob chuck into the headstock. Yep. Make sure it's locked in. Good. Right. Now, what you do, just put me on camera for a minute and I'll show you. Yep. Sorry, hang on a second. Move stuff around to get to my mouse. How you going, Mike? Sorry, I was a bit busy. Right. This is your drill. Yeah. Okay. You get your thing, put it into the hole like that and just yep. move it vertically up and down like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can do that. Right. Make sure you've got a good grip on the on the piece of timber. Yeah. It's the way we used to fit chisel handles with tangs on. Okay. <laughs> 
I've got a side cutting drill, makes it a lot easier. Well, yeah, but. Now you should have an elongated hole in the end of it. Yep. Nearly right. It's easy to moving it around, trying to do it with a Dremel, I tell you. Yes. I have to remember that trick. Yeah, it should fit over it nicely now. Have you got the piece to test it? Nah, I couldn't take it off. No, really not, with, not, not without spilling port all over the bar anyway. Yeah. <laughs> of course, you could have put your mouth under it and drunk it all, Joe. Yeah, I suppose, eh? Or I could have just offered to take the whole barrel home. It would have fit under <laughs> my arm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> right. Now, just see, see how strong it is by putting it over something and moving it. But don't break your drill. Yeah, I don't reckon it's going to be very strong. Eh? I don't reckon it's going to be very strong. Well, that's why I say I think you really need a fer ferrule on it. Yep, it broke off in there. No. <laughs> Now you know you need a hardwood. No, it didn't break. The the, the tooth bro the um brush broke inside it. Oh. Oh, it should be all right. I'll take it down and try it. I need to get that piece out now. <laughs> well, if you gently thump the back of it, it may just shock it out. <laughs> What's been going on, Mike? What have you been doodling with? No. Uh, as I said, that's the way we used to fit all the uh, the tools because they used to have tangs on them, not round bars at one time. Yep. Make myself a batch of bloody liquid beeswax and I, and I filled up a bottle and I've lost the bottle already. Oh, look at that. Just as I say it, I found the bottle. Woo! <laughs> Well, there you go. It's always the way. The best way to find something you've lost is make another one. Yes. <laughs> or buy some more. Yeah. No. <laughs> so how's your uh, your butterflies and stuff going now? Uh, I haven't I haven't moved, mate. Right. Haven't moved. Having a um, CBF. I uh, actually. Well, today's Monday. I'm going to find out how much the polyester resin is and give it a try. Yep. If it's still nice and cheap, I might just do a trial with just plain resin, see what happens. Oh, yeah. Where you uh, get your resin from? Uh, a place that used to be called Fiberglass International. Then it was called Nuplex, and now it's called some <laughs> other bloody name. I can't remember it. Yeah. Mm. We got a place here called um, uh, Adelaide Moulding and Castings, where we oh, can get yeah, out. Yeah, I know it. Yeah, they they supply the film industry and stuff with the uh, makeup for their scary scary faces and stuff. You know, all their silicon shit. Yeah. yeah. I prefer to go there because it's it's Adelaide, and I'm not giving some other bugger my delivery fee. You know. Polyesters and and normal 
epoxy sort of stuff, not the special stuff. They're usually cheapest going to the boat manufacturers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's where we I go. And that's Being the on the Great Lakes, there. we've got several big companies that make it. That's the... Um, that stuff that I've had was called that was called Prototype from Bunnings. That's that's who makes that a fiberglass company. Mike Mike said he's struggling to flatten and dimension a piece of oak to make a finger joint jig for table saw. Cost me five hours, three sanding belts, six splinters, many tear outs, and my pride. But he got there. <laughs> <laughs> There's six right. grain directions. Oh, I'll just fix that up, Mike. I'll just put it across the jointer and then through the thickness. So I'm going to I'm gonna ask a, an amateur wood question because I've seen them, but I've never actually looked at them or asked what they do. What does a jointer do? A jointer puts a right-angled face, two right-angled faces on a board. Can I get that in English? Sorry? Out over the long distance. Can I get yeah. that in English? Right, okay. So you've got a, a piece of timber that's just been come off the saw, right? Yeah. Now, generally when it comes off the saw, it's either, well, my table saw does cut a perfect right angle, so it's good. But um, most of them have ripples and things down them that you've got to flatten out, or they're slightly bent. The yep. timber has a, a bend from one end to the other. Yep. So what you do is you put it across a jointer, which is a big planer. Yep. With two big tables, one on each side. And you flatten it out on one face, generally yep. the face first. Flatten it out to get rid of all the ripples and the bend out of it. And then you turn it at right angles to do the edge. Okay. So that so that you end up with one one good face, one yeah. good edge that are okay. right angles to each other. Right. Or well, depending on where the fence on the joint is sent, like you can set it at any, any angle if you want to. Yeah. But normally it's to set it up square. And then you can put it through the thicknesser, which the Americans call a planer. Yeah. So that it's parallel down each face and each side. Okay, would that would that work good to do um, chopping boards, like to make segment board chopping boards kind of thing? You know, not... you've got to be very very careful, and you've got to have very sharp cutters if you're doing chopping boards because normally the grain runs every which way. Yeah. Yeah, but they're and using that... more and more carbide heads. So... So yeah, that that tends to help from tear out. Yeah, the heel, helical helical cutter heads are fantastic. Yep. But um, <coughs> the uh, <laughs> the best way of doing chopping boards, particularly if you're doing butcher box boards, is put them through a sander instead. Through a sander. Sorry. A through a sander. sander. A thicknesser, okay. <laughs> a thicknesser sander. They're yeah. Different. Okay. That's like different. I've got, like, oh. I've got out, like I've got out in the back shed. My, my list of tools is getting longer now. You better shut up. <laughs> no, you'd have to move out of the house, Joe, and demolish it. Okay. Just use the, the lounge room then? No, I'd move into the shed and demolish the house. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, my name's not Neil. Yeah, move into a camper. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> no no offence, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you. Yeah. I think your housing housing thing would have something to say about that. Oh yeah. They'd probably object strongly. I would think. Maybe, eh? Unfortunately. <laughs> Yes. Sorry. Housing Commission place. Yeah, yeah, they call it something different in the South Australia. 
That's a dirty word, commission. I don't like that. It, it's housing SA, all right? It sounds better. <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> I think housing commission and I think of all the um, apartment blocks they've got for all the um, unemployed and, you know, one yeah. of those areas, Robbo. We, we, don't, we don't really have those areas here. They're just more spread out and amongst everyone. <laughs> Didn't take long. The storm hit us. Uh, uh, pouring down rain. Good eye, Sid. Hi, Gun Sid. What it looks like. Oh yeah. Cool. Uh. You got you got green clouds. That's different. And the thing is, it's more to come. That's all of Michigan and up into Canada. All heading our way. <laughs> anyway, I'll catch you guys later. All right, Neil. See, ya. See you later. Thanks for coming in. He disappears quick, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. Well, he's like me when I, you know, when I'm leaving somewhere, I just say, See you all later and walk out the door. My yeah. wife, it's, it's like the. She has encores. <laughs> she, she says she's leaving and then 20 minutes later she's still talking? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know people like that too. There's a lot of elderly wood tenors like that. Yeah, no, when I'm going, I go. <laughs> when you're going, you're going. You're yep. going. I have some really odd weather patterns. Hey, you haven't you glitching out a little bit there, Bob? I'm just looking at the weather the weather radar. It's all in circles. Unless oh, I'm that, reading that, it wrong. That must be harp. <laughs> yeah, they got the um, harp antennas down in near Perth. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's from satellite. Yeah. Looking down on the oh. clouds. <laughs> well, I thought there was a reason why the government's been telling us all about aliens around the world. Is that what that is? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand the, the weather, especially around the Antarctica, being the swirl patterns because of the movement of the currents. I didn't realize okay, when, that New Zealand was south of you guys. Uh, it's not quite. Uh, the North Island's almost level with Sydney, I think. 
Um, if you turn your turn the roughing gouge over so that it's standing straight up and down, now do a peeling cut up there. You won't end up with a curve in it then, right? Just come up near the chuck. No, turn turn the gouge on its side. With the flute facing the chuck. Yes, like that. Now use the bottom edge to cut it straight in and get it down flat. See, mucho easy. Now you're doing the chook dance. I have to do that every now and again would get sawdust out from under my feet. Four to one gear reducing chuck. Oh. Don't quite know what you're talking about, Mike. I've probably seen one. Yeah, I got, <clears throat> I won't say bored, but got annoyed by you know, procrastination, and that bothers me. I'm used to being able to grab my banjo by the handle and uh, moving it around one-handed and placing it where I want it. And I haven't been able to, so. The problem with the early Powermatic lays, they didn't harden the bed enough, the bed ways. Every once in a while, I got to take a diamond card, a big one, a pair of them, and go over the bedway to take out the sharp cuts that get into it. And I, for a while, didn't know where they were coming from because <clears throat> I don't put anything on that would be sharp enough to cut into it. And I found it was the banjo, the bottom of the banjo had sharp casting marks so when yeah, you well, tighten the banjo down real tight it tends to damage or cut into the bedway well relieve the edges of the round the round the edges of the banjo off a bit oh i did that's uh, probably the second week i had the lathe because i was tired of it and the tail stock the same way i the bottom of it was just basically bare pop metal it wasn't pop metal it was ca you know cast iron but still it was sharp enough that you cut yourself on it and did you did you clean underneath the bed as well like where yes. all the locking plates go because that's where most trouble comes from yeah big it, it has a on the power matic it's a big round metal disc that it pulls up against the underneath side yeah and uh yeah i said just as part of my yearly thing i pulled the tailstock off and took took the bottom of that apart and took it its plate is rectangular but the banjo is round i don't know why but it's round yeah but, uh, oh no, that's normal. That's pretty well normal these days. They make them round so they slide along a bit easier. Uh, 
but uh, yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of gunk on it from other people that have used it. Friends of mine, they don't, maybe I'm fussy, but they don't care at times. They don't blow it off and they end up with pitch underneath. I'm doing a lot of green wood cutting. Now, what happens is sawdust gets down on it, and then when you lock it down, it compresses the sawdust and it sticks to the to the locks. Yes. Excuse me. Uh, people don't seem to do anything about that. And one trick I learned is when I do my lathe bed, uh, I do the top and I do the edge, the inside edge of it. And I also make sure that the disc and plate on the bottom of the banjo and tailstock are cleaned off. And then I will actually take and hone with d big diamond cards. Uh -huh. and around. Lucky you didn't have a dust extractor there or you'd be chasing it. <laughs> but I got all that cleaned up today and I'm back to one hand being able to to control it. Oh, I know what you mean now, Mark, yeah. I just, I must admit, I use up to four inch force and bits and uh, just fit them into the tail stock and regulate the speed on the head anyway, so. No, one of the things that I do do, and it, it was brought to my attention last year by somebody on Facebook as a hint, uh, is after you finish cleaning the surface of the bedway off, uh, and I put a bit of a wax on it, uh, is to take a heat gun over it lightly. Yeah. Because there's a lot of small scratches and dings and that in it before I got it. And the trick is is to fill those little dings with whatever wax and let it melt into them. It makes it slide so much easier just to hit it lightly with a heat gun. And then rub it in. Yeah, I never I never wax the beds of my lives. I just I spray oil down them and then I wipe it all off. I've been afraid to thinking because I often sit stock on the bed where I don't want to get oil on or that could get in the wood. I've had that mistake happen a few times, not because of the bed stock having oil on it, but dropping oil on it by accident, being too close to it when I'm trying to sharpen with a stone. Hey, Robbo, do you want to tell Mike what the handles are for? Yeah, I was just waiting for Bob to finish. Um, I dare say they're worldwide things, but a lot of, lot of pubs and clubs and things have a little wine barrel about 8 or 10 inches in diameter. It's a proper stave little barrel. And have a brass tap on the front to dispense a glass of port or something like that. But the the handle on the the tap is that small. The handle is only about an inch and a half or two inches long. And a lady that Jay met yesterday was having trouble because she's got arthritis. She's a bartender and uh, couldn't open the, the tap without putting an extension on it. So Joe's making a wooden extension to fit onto that handle so that she can just open it up. On one of the T pieces.
But, you know, turning tap handles is, uh, I won't say a big business here. I've done it over the years. Uh, but uh, I have a friend of mine, and he does it for a couple of commercial restaurant and food chain type programs. That, and they have, that's all he does for a living until yeah, they started big... going to China and getting CNC out of China. They're, um, they're brewery tap handles, so aren't they? They're big buggers. Yes. The ones mounted on the bar, yeah. Right, for looks. Uh, not that way, Jay. Always small side down. And uh, personally, I'd cut that off with a skew chisel so that it ends up nice and clean rather than using a parting tool. Michigan's got a lot of wineries, and uh, a friend of mine, I know, he's in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. He, he makes, that's his whole living, is making tap panels for the wineries. So he's an Uber, he's is he? He's got own pattern. Yep. He's an Uber, a not Uper. a troll. Right, a Uber. Uber, yeah. Uper. See, I'm starting to know the language. <laughs> and there's a lot of Michiganders that for some reason just don't get it but they don't travel oh. around the state a lot if otherwise they would get it now if you're a college student in Michigan we got schools both upper and lower peninsula they have their own set of slang that i won't repeat yeah be like some of the unis in australia i think yeah kids are kids and now with gaming where as adults we're way behind on interconnectivity but the kids aren't in gaming. It's like, oh, but Uncle Bob, I have friends all over the world, and we play every night together. Huh? You know, two years ago when the pandemic hit, and this is going to be different. No, just here, sit, watch. This person's from there, and they're pointing on their screen where they're from. This one's in Japan, but he has a translator, so when he types, it comes out in English. Yeah. <laughs> I saw something, and I don't know if you've been following uh, the AWDG, the European group. Uh, one of their members who does, well, he's a software programmer, but also he uh, he does a lot of work. And, uh, Good night, Chris. He, the, the headstock. You know, in the, the lathe that Jay has, there's a couple of holes that you can use for in the nose of the spindle in the cast iron where you can put a pin in. Yeah. You know, to anchor the spindle. Yeah, spindle he was lock. was doing that. Yeah, spindle lock pin. He was using it and had a chuck stuck, so he used that to hold the spindle so he could turn it off because it's a Reeves drive blade. And he tried and tried and tried. And he put a, a big commercial screw, oh, his knockout bar through the chuck. 
and closed the jaws on it to give him some leverage so he could turn the the chuck off and uh, it totally broke the nose the cast iron yep around the nose of the lathe off cracked a big chunk of it that's where they you know for indexing they have three holes he had to admit he never thought of it and he was using the top one so the other two underneath were the weakest ones and it broke a big chunk out of his lathe and it's going to run him uh, about 500 pounds plus shipping to get a new one from the manufacturer to pour a new casting I'll take it you saw what Mike said, is it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now they're still flourishing and ripping people off here, Mike. <laughs> yeah. Them and Coles. They got the The Monopoly. That's it. That's what I was looking for. Of course we do have Aldi and IGA, but yeah, we, we've had IGA for like 30 years, but um, yeah. um, uh, there was another one called Littles or something like that. Uh, yeah, I think that's a South Australian one. No, nah, they were going to come to South Australia and they decided not to because there wasn't enough population. Yeah, we used to have Franklin's here as well, but they got bought out by, I think, Woolworths. Uh, Franklin's got bought out by um, Big um Bilo, and then Bilo got bought out by someone else. <laughs> yeah. Coles or something like that. Yeah. Because like all the it was the brand that Bilo had was um, black and gold. That was their their version of home brand, and their yeah. Campbell's Warehouse they still stock black and gold stuff. Yeah. So someone's still making it out there. Don't don't ever buy tea bags or black and gold tea bags. God, they taste terrible. <laughs> Wilco, I've heard of that one too. You got another? There's one. There's a couple of stores I know. One's in Murray Murray Bridge. Yeah. What's it called? Don't know. I can't remember the name of it, but it's a big, it's a big family-owned group of supermarkets. There's a few in South Australia. Oh, you got um, Romo's, Romeo's, or something like that. No, no. Uh, Drake's. Drake's. Drake's, I think. Yeah, that's Drake. Foodland. Yeah. Yeah. Foodland started off and then Drake's Foodland came out and then um, Romo's Foodland came out. There's a couple of those around too. Oh, yeah. The The Drake ones are the here now. They're the bigger. They're, they're massive. They're, they make a Coles or a Woolies look small now. Yeah, that's and right. Yeah, the, the, store, the store in Murray Bridge is bloody huge. Yeah. Yeah, they have their own... Uh, little shopping mall these days yeah it's quite good it used to be the other way around they'd be the smaller shops you know and uh, <laughs> kind of igas are still like that here there's heaps yeah. of them around but they're, yeah they're, they're small and they're you know, they're not cheap That chuck's coming loose. Turn the light off. Turn the light off. I think that chuck's coming loose. No. Oh, it looked like it was shaking. No. All right. Okay. I was going to say you're tripping, but you're yelling, so I thought I'd better turn it off.
So I'll play it safe and give them two. Yeah. Just in case this one dies. This is um, bottle brush, this one. Yeah, uh, we do have spar, actually. Do mainly in mainly in small country towns. And we don't know. Yeah, no, we do. Like They're in South Australia somewhere. Some backwater hillbilly town, because I've never seen them. <laughs> I've been to plenty of towns a, in South Australia. No, I've got, I've got a funny feeling. Why not? I'll do a they're, Google search, actually. They're, they're all... Um, IGAs and stuff in our country towns or, or if Woolies or Coles has managed to get out there but Donna, I wish the RSL was open today I'd go down there and see if they fit So you've been um, got any projects? Have you been working on anything, Bob? Uh, Spar Australia is one of the fastest growing retail groups in Australia, with store numbers growth rising from 25 stores in 2006 to 75 stores in 2008, and over 150 stores in 2018. Where is it? They're mainly, looks like they're mainly in uh, New South Wales and Queensland. Yeah, I didn't think they were here. Yeah, but that's my problem. I get around so many places in Australia, I can never remember all the time. Yeah. Start looking like a road soon. Uh, <laughs> I, I once... I used to have a, a GPS that I could download to the computer and um, I'd, I downloaded all the places I'd been. God, it looked like the bloody, looked like a shell roadmap, I tell you. <laughs> you have such big distances between some of your major cities. Yeah. Big distances between all our major cities. <laughs> Do you have a, a, a car train that you can take? Put your car no, on you, it and take it? Or do you have to drive it? No, you can. You can. Yeah, there's some that you can put train, uh, your car on. Like the one that runs from Melbourne to Perth, which is three and a half thousand kilometers. Um, yeah, they have car carrying freight cars on them. Uh, the one that runs from Adelaide to Darwin does as well. Yeah, that's uh, the GAN, the GAN or something like that. I think the, that is. that's the, the GAN. Uh, the Indian Pacific is the one that runs across the from well from basically from Sydney to Perth. So if you want to look it up, Robert, uh, Doctor Bob, look up the GAN train, passenger train, and um, the Indian. Is that what it's called, Robert? Indian Pacific. There you go. Uh, well, because I follow trains, I love them. Uh, one of the ones I watch a lot of on YouTube is that have you ever caught train one? Exurgence. Yeah, yeah I caught ever? one. I caught <laughs> one once and I didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> Your wife tells you that about women. I thought. <laughs> <laughs> but I you know. know well. You know, Queensland, Queensland are bad because they've got signs on all their railway crossings. They must lose trains because they, uh, they've they got a sign on the railway crossing, look for trains. So, <laughs> I think I remember that one. Yeah, I, for years and years, if I want to go from Michigan to visit family that's not in Michigan, I just take the Amtrak, our railroad. It's, yeah. 
it's a, an overnight affair to DC, Northern Virginia, and leaves a, like at night here in Detroit, and you get in at noon the next day. Yep. Now my my wife went on the. Uh, Canadian one that runs through the Rockies and everything. Oh. The one with all the yeah. observation cars and everything on it. Yes. She she liked it that much that she wanted to, her and her friends just wanted to go back again. Just to start on the train and turn around and go back. <laughs> That's getting the one in Alaska between Fairbanks and Anchorage is a fantastic train ride. I'll tell you, yeah, she's, the Alaska wilderness. She's been on that too. When I lived there. That's what I took. I just, I didn't want to drive. It was cheaper when you figured the high price of gas. And if you break down in the winter, it might be, you know, a day and a half before a plow and wrecker could get to you. And there's no cell service back then at all. Uh, so they had the emergency phones every two miles along the road. So that still is a long walk. And at the worst, two miles. Yeah. That's better than two or three days, though, isn't it? Well, if you're knee deep in snow and a blizzard, in fact, you can't drive between Anchorage and Fairbanks in the winter, uh, between certain points. It's outside of North Pole, Alaska, at least when I was there, was a state checkpoint where the road was closed in the winter to an extent that you had before you could drive on it you had to have like two spare tires, a mechanical jack for change. You had to have two days worth of food and water and blankets or sleeping bags in case you get stranded along the, the road, you know, because they were just finding too many people frozen to death in their cars that would think oh. they knew how to drive and they'd die. And, all you know, that, it'd be minus 25. All that just to get a bottle of milk far out. <laughs> yeah. But the state owns the railroad, and it's, you know, it's a really an interesting railroad. It, it actually does what's known as flag stops, because there's a lot of people who live along the railroad right away. And yep. the conductors know where they are. You can say, I want to go to so-and-so's house. And the engineer will blow the whistle, uh, you, let, you know, and letting you know, the other people know that they have passengers there, a certain whistle to for them. You know, that, in Australia. They let you off. And <laughs> in, in Australia, they're called whistle stops. Yeah, they are there, too. But a lot of Alaska is serviced that way. They're, they're you know, they have, shopping and everything is that is by, you know, <laughs> they get go to town for the day, and on their way back, the train takes them up and takes them the other direction, home again. Yeah, well, I used to do that in the outback, but these days most big stations now have aeroplanes and they just fly in on, on a Saturday and do a normal shop. Like driving to the supermarket. Yeah. A lot of the villages in Alaska, that's the only way around. Yeah. Thank you, my ears, thank you.
Yeah, I, quite a lot of people use that channel. The channel, the channel. Car train. I think my mum and dad did when they were over there for a while. Because they delayed the that... time and the money. I'd want to take the Orient Express from England through the Channel and beyond. No, nah, too be many nice bloody. No, nah, too many bloody murders on the Orient Express. <laughs> Yeah, well, you got to wear formal attire to dinner, too. I mean, they have a strict dress code. I was looking it up one day. Uh, they they got a dress code, both there and the, they have an Orient Express dinner train that they run in England, a few cars. And they're strict. And it's not cheap. Yeah, we have specialist... Um train trips out here like uh, you know like the murder train trip and uh, this sort of train trip and everybody dresses up in character fun actually got restaurant yes. trains as well I've done two murder trains here in Michigan we've got three yeah three separate steam trains <laughs> that do that on old logging right of ways they're up to par for it but and their steam. And the one overnight one, it cost me almost $400. And that was probably eight, nine years ago, but it was worth it. Yeah, mom and, mom and dad were over in England for uh, oh, 25 months. It was nearly two, over two years. Just because mum wanted to see the four seasons in England, that was the only reason they went. But they had to be kicked out every three months or something to renew their visa. So they had friends in France and used to go and stay with them for a week. We had one that I went on. It was probably 10 years ago here in Michigan. And it took about three hours to even get to the starting of it. But uh, it was uh, an overnight trip. We took off and it was dinner on the way and a little history of what we were going to. And it was a ghost town. Had an old hotel in it and it was a tourist trap type thing. but And you could drive to it. I mean, it was a well-known Michigan ghost town. But that's where the train spent overnight. And we all got off the train. And we were having dinner, uh, late dinner and drinks at the hotel. We had lunch on the way there, but on the train, but dinner. And what was interesting, we're all sitting around the dinner table and they're talking about, and there was 20, maybe 22 people. They were, you had to be, there were a couple of single rooms. Most were double and it was in an old hotel. And uh, in dinner, we're talking about all the rules and how the murder mystery would start. Uh, at midnight and it would last until oh I th think it was five or six o'clock the next day when they would get together for a late brunch and then we the train would pick us up and we'd have dinner on the train and it took us back we got in about 11 o'clock at night but what got me is we're all sitting around, we know each other, and drinks, wine is on the house, all local wines. Of course, they want you to buy bottles to take with you. And we're sitting talking about the rules. And all of a sudden, one of the women had to go, 
and had to go get something from her room because she needed, I don't know what it was, but something. So we're all sitting around the parlor and she takes off and all of a sudden there's this blood streaking scream and everybody ran to the lobby to see what was going on. Well, the elevator doors had opened for her to go upstairs and our waiter for dinner was hanging by the neck in the elevator shaft. The mystery was on. <laughs> yeah, what a way to on. start a night. <laughs> they was all stage actors, all safety. Of course I am. Yeah. But I'll tell you, <laughs> that was really, that was the most fun, but it was worth the Almost four hundred dollars for the whole thing. You got a full dinner show, but you were part of it. That's right. Well, that's the way they all are. The Seven Valley Steam Railway. Now, I've got a funny feeling I've got seen uh, YouTube videos on that one. Um, yeah, I know they run a lot of steam trains in England, like for tourists. Uh, use we've got about uh, probably in all of Australia I think we've got probably 12 to 14 there's an interesting one in New South Wales it's called the zigzag railway and the only way they could get up the hill or up the gradient was to go up that way and then it came back the other way up onto the next thing and it, it zigzagged its way up the, the top of the hill Interesting railway. In Victoria, we have Puffing Billy, which is uh, a tourist trap these days. Well, here in Michigan, we have a Christmas train that travels on weekends, and uh, it's steam, and Santa's on the train going to the different small communities and they stop at different communities and it's a, a fundraiser for getting stuff out to some of the homeless so they have a, a good Christmas but it's always fun to take that train yes I saw that and it's uh that, that was actually fantastic. The, I saw the first run and it had done after it had been reconditioned. And I must admit, it's one of my favourite trains. I've, for years, I actually had a picture of it, of uh, smoke and steam trailing all the way back down the carriages and everything, and she was going like the clappers. In fact, they had a race... Um, I think it might have been Top Gear or somebody had a race from uh, wherever the, the Flying Scotsman left in London to Edinburgh. Some were in cars, some were in the train, and uh, that was an interesting show, actually. Oh, yeah. I vaguely remember watching that. Before BBC America, the, our TV BBC here that they run in America, uh, we used to have to watch most of the British stuff through the CBC in Canada, Canadian Broadcasting, across the river from us, but they covered the Detroit area well, too. <coughs> yes, Mark, that was the one where they rebuilt it. And then it's inaugural run as well. I thought it was rather interesting that a lot of family members that were the original engineers and things on the train, their children have taken up the, the same occupation to keep it going. Yeah, I'd imagine that that would have been pretty interesting seeing Stevens, Stevenson's rocket run. 
it's a pity that steam trains went out, but they used to take too much to to feed and they were limited in water supply. That was the problem. Or the water carrying capacity. And maintenance was really high because nothing was standardized. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We've got a lot of the small steam railways here in the States and Canada, but they're all tourists, but it's really growing. What are you making, Joe? Um, I was just having a fiddle battle around with um, a uh, design I did ages ago. Just need this bit to be a bit longer, that's all. I just couldn't use this piece of wood because it's got a hole drilled in it from where I had it as oh, my, yeah. my leg from my other lathe. Um, I've got a tendon on it at least. Drill a hole in it, fill it with candle wax, done. Oh, yeah. Um, I've got a Amber's um, niece does um, candles and um, candle melts and all that kind of stuff. So, oh yeah, she's she's seen one of these hollow and liked it. And I said, uh, I said, how much they are to buy singly, or if you want to buy in bulk, how much they are to buy, and she's going to buy in bulk. So, oh. Well. <laughs> You just well, gotta drill them out. Yeah, I'm just having a play with this one. I don't think I'll give her this one though, because what you gotta be careful of is making sure they're flame proof. That's the biggest problem. Yeah. Well the if I make them wide enough and it's only got one one candle in the middle, one wick in the middle. Yeah. It's not so bad because the one that I've made originally is like like that. Yeah, I know I don't I didn't I never used to worry about it, but a lot of people do these days. I've actually ran a series of tests to see what had happened, and yep. uh, they never burnt. They never got hot enough to burn. No, I didn't think so. It'd have to be a big um, tiki torch flame on it, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm gonna knock it on the head. Amber, just as I was starting this, Amber came out and asked me if I wanted my lunch yet because she was going to cook it. So. Yeah, no worries. Yo, I'm, batching, I'm batching today. Julie's not home. That's why I'm still out here. <laughs> so I'll go, and have some, I'll go and have something to eat as well. So Baked beans on all. toast? No, yep. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> all right, see you all later. Thanks for coming in. See you later, Bob. See you, Chris. See you, See you Mike. See you, Sid, if you're still in there. And yeah. the tree people. Yeah. I think that's about it. <laughs>